On October 4, 1966, in Lexington, Kentucky, two friends, Charles Summers and John McGraw, decided to explore the Appalachian Trail. One of them disappeared in the most horrific of ways. Two friends, one an adventurous explorer and the other a weary software engineer, decide to hike the Appalachian Trail, a place notorious for mysterious disappearances. What starts as an escape from the monotony of daily life turns into a nightmarish journey as they encounter a terrifying cult deep in the woods. The engineer escapes but finds himself irrevocably changed, descending into a horrifying cycle of cannibalistic behavior back in his mundane life. His dark secret is eventually discovered, leaving him to grapple with the monstrous identity he's developed. A chilling exploration of how stepping out of one's comfort zone can lead to unimaginable horrors. On a chilling evening in Lexington, Kentucky, the air was so thick with dread that it seemed to press against your skin, a tactile reminder of humanity's darker instincts. Emily Thompson, an investigative reporter whose byline was synonymous with tales of true horror, took cautious steps into the sterile walls of a maximum security prison. The room's temperature dropped a few degrees when Charles entered, his eyes meeting Emily's. His gaze was a jarring mix of weariness and an unsettling predatory gleam. His eyes seemed to plead and warn simultaneously. Charles, Emily began, her voice steady but her heart pounding. Your case has both horrified and fascinated the nation. Your life seemed so ordinary, so mundane even. A heavy pause filled the room, almost as if time held its breath. Shackled and garbed in a prison jumpsuit, Charles shuffled in his seat, every move laced with a quiet agony. Emily's stomach churned, her journalistic instincts battling her primal urge to flee. The way Charles leaned back, his eyes going out of focus, it was as if he was staring into some distorted, nightmarish past. Charles began taking a deep breath as though summoning the strength to relive his own horrors. His words were like the slow, inexorable pull of quicksand, dragging Emily from the sanctuary of her ordinary world into a confining prison cell of unimaginable terror. As I sat in the dimly lit corner of the bearded bear, sipping on my third pint of ale, John launched into yet another tale of his latest escapade. This time, he'd tracked polar bears in the Arctic. The pub around us was as familiar as it was comforting, filled with wooden furnishings that whispered years of hidden conversations. You've got to get out there, man. The world's too big for you to be stuck behind a computer, John said, snapping me out of my thoughts. He pulled out his phone and started showing me breathtaking pictures from his adventures, oceans, mountains, and animals that most people only see on the screen. Come with me to the Appalachian Trail, he proposed, pulling up a blog post describing the hauntingly beautiful area. Each word was like a paintbrush, promising to add color to the dull grays that were my days as a software engineer. Over a handshake and a clinking of glasses, our plan was done. John showed me a news article on his phone to add a touch of drama. More than 20 people who went hiking on the Appalachian Trail never returned, he read, his eyes shimmering with excitement. The risk, it seemed, was part of the adventure. We decided to keep the trip a secret. In the back of my mind, a nagging thought told me we should tell anyone about our plans. But the excitement... The allure of stepping out of my dull life muffled that voice of reason. I had no idea this decision would leave me desperately isolated, my only lifeline cut, all channels to the outside world severed. Before setting out, I called my parents. Our talk had a heavy feel, as if we were saying goodbye instead of just catching up. John, meanwhile, shot off a quick text to his editor. He was a pro. He could afford to be casual about his deadlines. We reached our selected campsite, a spot that looked like it came straight out of a fairy tale. A babbling brook completed the idyllic picture, its gurgles like nature's lullaby. I took a deep breath. The damp earth smell filled my nostrils. For a moment, I thought we'd stepped into a peaceful otherworld. 
For me, setting up the camp was a never-ending cycle of failure. The instruction manual might as well have been hieroglyphics. Knots formed where there shouldn't be, poles went in the wrong sleeves, and my tent leaned to one side like a sad origami project. John made it look like child's play. His tent was up in no time, every rope and peg in its place. He chuckled at my clumsy efforts but tried to guide me, showing me the correct way to secure the ropes and stakes. S'mores were on the menu as the evening drew close, the sky fading from a warm orange to a haunting dark blue. John broke out a bottle of bourbon, and we toasted to adventure, gulping down liquid warmth to fend off the creeping chill. Our chat veered towards tales of the Appalachian Trail and its long history of people mysteriously vanishing without a trace. A kind of thrill surged through me as I nibbled on a marshmallow. It felt daring, tempting fate to talk about disappearances while surrounded by impenetrable darkness. But as the fire dwindled, the mood changed. An unsettling quiet replaced our laughter. A rustle echoed from the trees, but it wasn't comforting. An owl hooted in the distance. It was crying for something lost. With the night's festivities over, we retreated to our tents. My body was tired, but my mind was a whirlpool of thoughts and fears. Suddenly, I woke up to the rustling sound, like someone was passing by our tents. The air was still. Even the leaves had stopped rustling. The quiet was unnatural. Then, a wind howl tore through, morphing from a whisper to a wail. John's eyes met mine as he zipped open his tent. He picked up a hefty branch from the ground. It wasn't much of a weapon, but it was something. He nodded at me, the understanding clear between us, and disappeared into the dark woods. Now alone, I tried to distract myself. I fumbled for my phone, scrolling aimlessly. I considered bears, wolves, and more unlikely threats like mountain lions. Somehow, these real-world dangers felt trivial compared to the eerie mood that the forest now exuded. It felt as though the very trees were watching, listening, and waiting. But suddenly, a scream cut through the night. It wasn't just any scream, it was John's, filled with terror that words can't capture. It shook the air and seemed to reverberate through my very bones. My phone fell from my hand onto the grass, its screen dimming, unimportant now. For a brief moment, I froze, unable to move, think, or breathe. That was John out there. Something awful had happened to him. And whatever it was, it was beyond any horror we had laughed about or even imagined. My hands trembled as I grabbed my makeshift branch. Taking a deep breath to muster my little courage, I plunged into the menacing darkness where even the wind seemed to warn me to turn back. My eyes catch footprints in the damp soil just beyond the edge of our campsite. They lead deeper into the forest, side by side, as if John and some creature walked together into the dark. My gut churns. I should turn back and call for help, but my phone taunts me with a no-signal icon. I think of John's courage and press on, my hand gripping his branch like a lifeline. The night seemed to stretch on as I walked, every second feeling like an eternity. Finally, I came across a man, or what looked like a man. His name was Elijah, he said. His height was unnerving, towering over me like a twisted tree. His body was a roadmap of scars and strange tattoos, as if each told a horrifying story. His eyes were the worst part, cold and lifeless, like two pieces of coal. It felt like staring into a deep pit you couldn't see the bottom. Looking for your friend? His voice was as cold as his eyes, but his smile was colder still. It was an offer, but the menace hanging in the air made it clear this was a dangerous game I was playing. For a split second, my mind raced. I thought of running and returning to an everyday life with family, work, and holiday get-togethers. But the alternative was too grim to consider. 
becoming another name on the long list of unexplained tragedies in these woods. The branch trembled in my grip, but my resolve, shaky as it was, won out. I met Elijah's icy stare and nodded. It wasn't courage that moved me, but a mixture of loyalty, desperation, and perhaps a twisted form of hope. As I took that fateful step toward him, a nasty thought crept into my head. Was this loyalty or sheer stupidity? Following Elijah into the inky heart of the forest, I felt like every step weighed me down. The clearing that greeted us was a testament to horror, an absolute nightmare. Crudely built huts loomed, created from a revolting blend of mud, bone, and what seemed like human hair. The stench of death, rotting and thick, filled my nostrils, making each breath feel tainted. But the altar in the clearing center truly froze my blood. Constructed from grotesque, misshapen stones, the images etched onto its surface were otherworldly, representing vast, monstrous beings from realms unknown. And the stains. They looked so dark, so thick, so... human. My gaze darted around, searching for John. When I found him, my heart stopped. John's eyes, once full of life and energy, stared blankly. He was gone. And here in this hellish place, was where his longing for adventure had brought him. A guttural cry threatened to escape me, but I swallowed it down. Horror had me tightly in its grip. Elijah stepped forward, his voice deepening, and began to preach. The words that left his lips felt twisted and wrong, a vile version of spirituality. He spoke of forces dark and powerful, entities beyond this world, praising and sanctifying the awful scene around us. The crowd murmured in response, a chilling, synchronized chant that echoed his words. Before I could comprehend, before I could shout or scream, they descended on John's body. It was a sickening display. His blood collected in a bowl while others dragged his limp form into a nearby hut. The sounds from within, the slicing and dicing, tortured my ears. And when a man emerged, holding a dish with parts that once belonged to John, my vision swam. They cooked it over a flame that danced too merrily for such a grim act. The oddly inviting smell was a stark contrast to the horror of it all. I was paralyzed with dread when a bowl of the raw, red liquid was thrust into my hands, followed by the cooked parts. My stomach churned as the crowd closed in, their eyes demanding submission. They were adamant. I had to consume. I had to join them. Sip by sip, bite by bite, I felt the world shift around me. With every swallow, revulsion warred with a growing, monstrous pleasure. Tears streamed down my face and my hands shook uncontrollably. Every fiber of my being screamed to reject it all, to defy these monsters. But a dark corner of my mind began to enjoy it, to relish in the grotesque feast. Finally, I couldn't take any more. I pushed the dish away, drawing a line in the sand. Whatever twisted pleasure I felt, I wouldn't give in entirely. I couldn't. The weight of my actions and the chilling depths of this forest commune pressed down on me. Just when I thought it was over, that I was sucked into this vortex of madness for good, something broke the spell. A loud, undefined noise, a clash or a bang, I couldn't tell, interrupted the cult's chant. Confusion rippled through the crowd, reaching even the unflappable Elijah. Elders huddled around him, whispering urgently. It was like someone had torn a hole in the fabric of their grim reality. I didn't waste time pondering what broke the spell. As raw as it gets, my fight-or-flight instinct kicked into overdrive. I ran like my life depended on it, because it did. Rocks and roots cut into my feet as I dashed through the forest. Branches whipped against my skin. But the pain was secondary to the adrenaline that pumped through my veins, driving me away from the nightmare behind me. I didn't stop until the trees thinned, and I stumbled onto a road, gasping, drenched in sweat but alive. 
Fast forward, and there I was, back in my cubicle. Same old desk, same old computer screen. Only it wasn't the same. Every line of code and email ping felt surreal, like tiny dots in a picture I no longer recognized. I sat among people I'd known for years, but felt like an alien among them. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, the wolf no longer knew himself. Each keystroke, each casual, how's it going from a co-worker, grated on me. I was living a lie, and the mask was slipping. Calls started coming in. First from John's family, then from my own office. Have you heard from John? Is John with you? Each call was a cruel reminder of a reality I wanted to forget but couldn't. How could I answer them? Even a lie seemed unbearable to utter. So, I let the phone ring and go unanswered. Days bled into weeks, and something within me began to shift. A disquiet clawed at the corners of my mind. Foods I once relished now tasted bland, even repulsive. Instead, an unidentifiable craving gnawed at me, insidious and constant. I found myself studying people, not in a casual, people-watching way, but with a hunger that tightened my gut. The terrible truth settled in like a winter fog, inescapable and cold. I hadn't just escaped that cult. I had changed. It was a transformation at the core of my being. Desires, once awakened, can turn into demons, and mine refused to be silenced. I felt disgust and a sickening acceptance. This was my identity. It seemed the only way to stave off the hunger was to feed it. I started inviting co-workers over for dinner, people who didn't know me too well or wouldn't be missed. My culinary skills grew, but the key ingredient was always the same. Human flesh, a meal to last me through the month until my next dinner guest. My life entered a grim cycle, a routine no less horrifying for its familiarity. But my secret life wasn't as secure as I'd thought. My neighbor, Mark, noticed something odd one night. I left my house clutching a bag, bulky and strangely shaped. Suspicion, perhaps his twisted curiosity, led him to follow me to the isolated spot where I dumped it. I felt a sense of release as I returned home, unaware that Mark approached the bag and opened it. What he found, bits of human flesh and organs, must have turned his stomach, but not enough to keep him from dialing the cops. The police raid was swift. A cursory search of my freezer revealed its morbid contents. I was arrested, and as they led me away, the horror of it all hit me. I was a monster, not by birth but by experience. A horror story comes to life. As I looked back at my house one last time, the realization stung me like a hundred bees. I hadn't just escaped a horror, I had become one. Ultimately, the horror wasn't just in the dark forest or a twisted cult, but within me. The events I had been through didn't scare me, they shaped me into a nightmare. And even as the cell door closed behind me, the true terror settled in the knowledge that, given the chance, I would have continued down this horrifying path, led by appetites too terrible to name but impossible to ignore.